Good Gardening, people. This is episode number 17 of our series. Today we're going to be discussing uh, very briefly in review uh, fungus, because fungus is among us. It is coming up on June, and those in the southern areas have already experienced it. We're starting to experience it here. You people in the north, you're going to finally be glad you live someplace cold. You won't be getting it till July, but everybody's going to get the fungus sooner or later. So I'm going to review very quickly uh, the steps to avoid fungus in your garden. And then we're going to go on and discuss insect problems, which also are by coincidence happening at the same time as fungus. Yes, it all bad happens at the same time. That's the nature of gardening. It all looks beautiful in the spring, but you're a real gardener if your garden looks good in the middle of summertime. So to avoid diseases, one, plant your peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, and tobacco apart from one another. They cannot touch one another as individual plants or touch each other in various rows. Don't plant near pokeweed, which is also in their family. It's a weed that's kind of fleshy and has purple berries. Uh, it carries a whole bunch of different uh, funguses and it will expose those plants and get it started in a big way. So you want to clear all the pokeweed out of the area. Put space between the plants. They should not touch. Rotate plants yearly to a new location. You can't grow the tomatoes in the same spot every year. They can develop what are called nematodes. So you have to move the plants from one end of the garden to the other and then on the third year, a third place and then on after that, you can go back to the original spot where they were before. When buying seed or uh, potted plants, look for the label that says disease resistant, especially on tomatoes, or the letters V, VF, F, FF, or several other letters that show the types of fungus that that particular plant is resistant to. Also, it would be a good idea to talk to your nurseryman and find out what fungus is common in your area. Avoid plants by doing a little research that are prone to that type of fungus. And as I said before, expect fungus in June and July. When the temperatures are warm at night and it's wet on the plant, then those are perfect fungus conditions. Don't brush up against multiple plants. When you're out picking or weeding or whatever, you cannot uh, touch one plant with your body and then brush up against another. You become the pathogen yourself. Uh, so you have to be careful when you're out there. That's one reason I plant the rows far apart and the plants far apart so that I can maneuver around them to do maintenance. Uh, wear disposable plastic gloves. They don't have to be expensive, but your hands do the same thing. If you touch the plant, you can cause a fungus. Also, if you're a smoker, if you're touching tobacco, tobacco carries tobacco mosaic. It will spread fungus to any number of different plants in that family. Trim off all of the yellow leaves and the green leaves that are touching those yellow leaves if you start to get a fungus. Fungus tend to start at the bottom of the plant, work their way up. So you gotta cut off the bad ones in the next set because the next set's already exposed and will get the fungus. Don't water the leaves, water the base of the plant only. You uh, don't wanna have wet leaves at night, okay? Plant several strains of tomato or those other crops if possible. One may catch fungus while the others don't. That way, at least you can get a crop. And if you're, you're using a fungicide, uh, you're going to find they're only partially effective and the longer you use them, the less effective. So you generally have to switch fungicides about once every two weeks until fungus season is over. And last of all, water only in the mornings or midday, never in the evening or at night or else you definitely are gonna come down with something bad. So coming up next, we have about a 15 minute presentation on the slideshow. Yes, another slideshow, all about bugs. Now bugs are a major carrier of, of uh, diseases to plants. They damage not only your plant, but they leave behind a calling card of a disease. So you have multiple reasons you wanna keep bugs out of your garden which is not always the easiest thing to do. And they will be vicious come June.
So everything in your garden is looking mighty good until bug season starts. Tum ta da dum. Yes, bugs appear from nowhere. Very busy ones. They are bent on destroying your garden. They're busy building their nests and they build them quick. But be not afraid. Even after all of your hard work, there are answers to solve this problem. Sometimes they're difficult answers. Meanwhile, the bugs are out there ravaging your garden as we speak. They're starting now, but it'll get worse. Your plants, they had been so happy there in April and May, growing without any kind of a difficulty in the beautiful spring sunshine. But that has come to pass. Meanwhile, now, those bugs are busy feasting and upon your dime, and it gets worse. And worse. And worse. This looks like a job for Superman. Yes, this is no time to hide in a hole. You need to become proactive rather than reactive and get ahead of those bugs because they attack from the ground. They attack from the air. They're big ones. And there are small ones, but they're all busy making even more bugs. The time is time to learn about bugs. We start off with the aphid, also known as the ant cow. A lot of times you'll see ants in association with them because they come out and milk them of their honey and bring it back to their home. The cutworm, which is a problem both for your grass and garden. They like to cut plants directly at the base right to the ground. The cabbage looper, which likes to chew on uh, cabbages and lettuce plants. There's a lot of other caterpillars too, probably more too many to mention. The grasshopper, a voracious eater, and he can hop great distances, so he is kind of a target of opportunist. The harlequin beetle likes to lay its leg, eggs in your uh, garden, and when they hatch, they eat up your plants, and then in the uh, wintertime, they move in your house. The horned caterpillar, whose mother is the hummingbird moth, they can polish off an entire field in one day. Japanese beetles love to go inside of your roses where they're safe from uh, insecticides and destroy the plant from within. Katie did, not to be confused with these uh, lacewing, which is a friendly bug. They look kind of similar, but the Katie did is a, a bad guy. So is the leaf hopper. And those are really hard to catch if you're trying to do it organically. You're not going to be get, knocking those out with your fingertips. They can hop very fast. The pill bug, which we always call the roly poly, they do damage to the root systems. I always thought they were cute as a kid and used to play with them. The potato beetle, uh, they can breed prodigiously and wipe out in all kinds of crops, not just potatoes. You always know them by their stripes. Scale, the worst thing you can possibly get in a garden. Hopefully you'll never get it in your uh, vegetables. You're more likely to get it on your trees and shrubs. Once you get it, it's bad, bad news. The slug, it's not really an insect. He's a, 
uh, actually closer related to an octopus than anything else on land. And the snail, also in the same family, uh, they're fairly easy to kill, but you got to get ahead of them. You see one snail one night, then the next day you get 10 million of them. The adult squash fine borer, they're out active right now laying eggs. Their eggs hatch generally around the end of June or uh, and their uh, grubs begin to feed with inside the vines of your plants. One day you'll have a fleshy, beautiful looking bunch of uh, uh, squash or cucumbers. The next day they'll all be flat and dead. The stink bug, not only is he annoying for uh, eating plants and leaving eggs, the larvae do the same, but if you crush one, it creates a horrible smell and an acid burn on your fingers. The tobacco budworm, like many, many other worms, voracious eaters, they don't stick just to tobacco. Those are some of the bad bugs that you have to put up with. There are many, many more, but of course, this is only a half hour class. I don't think you want me to sit here and recite the entire encyclopedia of bugs. Whatever bugs you see out there could be bad. This one, however, is not a bad bug. The assassin bug nymph kills the bad bugs for you. But when you start seeing good bugs, it's because you have too many bad bugs. So good bugs are bad too, because that means you've got an infestation of something they can eat. Dragonflies, good bug. It's like lions in the savannah. They don't ever clean off all of the wildebeests and, and antelope. There's always millions more for them to feed on. So when you start seeing good bugs around, you've got a bug problem that's uh, bigger than they are. The honeybee is a uh, pollinator, one of your best friends. Make sure you have fruit. They keep the human race alive. So you don't want to kill your honeybees. The bigger the bee, the better. Bumblebees are also quite uh, useful and good friends. This is uh, eggs on a parasitic wasp from the parasitic wasp on a, a horned caterpillar. Uh, again, that's a good bug that kills the ones that are, are destroying your garden. If I see those, I tend to take the caterpillar and toss them off on a weed and let them eat that and let the, the uh, larva hatch off of them so that we have more parasitic wasps around. The hoverfly looks kind of like a bee, looks kind of like a fly, but he likes to kill larvae of uh, uh, bad insects. So he's a friend. They call him the hoverfly because he you know, hovers in the air like a helicopter. Everybody knows the ladybug and everybody knows they're friendly. However, there are a couple of copycat bugs that look like ladybugs that have more spots. They're not friendly. So be sure it's a ladybug before you start saying, oh, what a pretty little bug. The praying mantis uh, certainly has a bad reputation about uh, lovemaking where they eat their lovers' heads off while they're having sex. But when they're out there uh, harvesting bad insects, nobody can beat them. They're the best. Then there's a red soldier beetle. They have a tendency to uh, come in uh, groups and uh, clean off all of the bad bugs in an entire area for you. So that's another good one to have. Then the robber fly. I've never seen one of these things, but I thought it was so cool when I saw a picture of it. I said, I got to put that one up. You can see here he's attacking some kind of beetle and to totally annihilating it. It must be terrifying for a bug to see one of those things coming. The spider, speaking of terrors, we don't all like spiders, I know, but they are great insectivores. They love to eat insects. So if you have spiders in your garden, keep that in mind. Which would you rather have, vegetables or no spiders? Even the big green ones are friendly. And last of all, earthworms, which uh, provide aeration and uh, a worm casting in the soil that is absolutely enriching to it. And you don't want to kill them. And everything you put on the plants eventually winds up in that soil. So keep that in mind. Those are the good bugs, the ones we want to keep. And because of that, we have to think carefully about how to fight the bad bugs. Because what you do to one, you're likely going to be doing to the other unless you take certain precautions. You may be asking yourself, but what to do to kill the bad and leave the good? 
And that is a darn good question, one that has troubled gardeners for a long time. There are always the organic methods. You can go pick them off the, the, the leaves of the plant. You can swat them with fly swatters. But as you can see, sometimes it's an overwhelming problem that just isn't going to work organically. Or the other option, the other extreme, is to use high-tech chemicals, some of which are toxic not only to the bugs, but to us as well, for us to breathe, uh, for us to uh, get exposed to get, get carcinogens. So you can see this guy's dressed up like Darth Vader trying to spray his plants. That also seems like a ridiculous extreme. There has to be a happy medium between that and swarms of locusts. What works without poisoning my food or the friendly insects? That is the $64,000 question. And the one I'm going to attempt to answer for you based on my own experience with uh, uh, insecticides and pesticides. There are many, many chemicals out there, but I've over the years kind of narrowed my choices. Now, a lot of the ones that were good, that worked, have been outlawed for one reason or the other. Pretty much that's a rule of thumb. If it's good, then the government's going to outlaw it. On the organic side, we have diatomaceous earth. Now, diatomaceous earth, I do not give a real high ranking, but it does work well against a target insect. It uh, will kill some of the bugs very effectively and others it will not touch. So it only gets about a five out of 10 as far as my scale of uh, effectiveness goes. If you are to magnify this and look at it very close up under magnifying uh, under a microscope, it's millions of little tiny fossils that are razor sharp and they cut the insect, and then he bleeds to death. The only problem is most insects have an exoskeleton, so it only works against worms and caterpillars and nymphs, nymphs being the immature bug. When he first hatches out, he doesn't have a shell yet. So those are the, the ones that uh, it will work against, but you're never going to get ahead of the adult insects if you already have an infestation using diatomaceous earth. Therefore, diatomaceous earth, I would say, doesn't work too well. That's kind of a general opinion held by me and a lot of other gardeners. A lot of organic gardeners swear on the stuff, but then they don't mind the spots on the apples and saving the birds and the bees. This certainly doesn't hurt birds or bees. They can uh, certainly say that about it. I prefer a chemical called permethrin. Now, permethrin is a chemical that is manufactured but what they've done is copied an existing chemical that is natural, that comes from a, a flower that uh, is toxic to, to uh, insects. And so they've created a whole family of these and uh, it's not harmful to warm blooded animals. It's a systemic copy of the toxin made by chrysanthemums. It's non-toxic to all warm blooded animals you do have to be careful with it that it doesn't get into streams or uh, ponds nearby because fish are cold blooded, so it would kill fish. And you also have to be careful not to spray it directly in blooms because it might uh, damage any uh, uh, bees that are going into the flowers. It's a topical. That means you put it on the outside of the plant and it is not absorbed by that plant. It's only on the surface of the plant. And if it's touched, it doesn't hurt the insects. So friendly insects that might land on the plant like the bees are not harmed. But if they attempt to eat it, well, guess what happens? So topical means you apply it to the outside and it doesn't enter the system. And that's uh, probably the safest thing that you can use in gardening, which is why permethrin is my first go-to chemical if I'm having problems with insects. It can be washed off, and it's not harmful even if you don't get it all. <coughs> Excuse me. Then there's imidacloprid. Imidacloprid is a very uh, top gun in the way of uh, killing bugs. It's very effective against just about all species. With the possible exception of adult scale, it'll take anything out. It, however, is not a topical. It is systemic. It works really well 
but leaves toxins in edible plants. So I don't really recommend it for uh, uh, vegetable gardening. You would have to spray it really early on in the plant's life and then give it about two months before you can eat the plant so that it would work it out of the system. It is systemic, meaning it enters the plant and permeates all the plant tissues. That would include the food portions. So you'd wind up eating some of your own toxin that was meant for the insects. It does ever work great on things like uh, ornamental plants like roses or trees or shrubs. You'd even use it on fruit, tr fruit trees if you used it early enough in the season. I wouldn't do it uh, before, uh, after that I had blooms. So. Then there's seven. Seven is probably the most popular garden chemical out there. Uh, farmer, uh, gardeners have been using it for years. It's been around, I don't know, since the 50s at least. But uh, it is not my first choice. It's probably my last choice. Even though it's terribly effective, seven is both a topical, which means it's on the outside, it doesn't permeate the plant, and a contact toxin, meaning that it kills the insect if the insect touches it. They don't have to eat it, all they have to do is touch it. Imidacloprid and uh, permethrin, however, only kill insects who eat it. The advantage of that is you don't kill the bees, and you don't kill the earthworms, and you don't kill all the friendly uh, uh, my predator bugs that are out trying to uh, hunt the bad bugs. It does not enter your food, which is a good thing, but it kills both friendly and non-friendly insects, which is a bad thing. So if you want to keep your bees and you want to keep your earthworms, I don't recommend seven. However, it does sterilize the entire garden very fast and gets rid of bugs. Then there's spinosad, which is the odd duck of the chemical family. Uh, it's not ever my first choice when I'm going to have an insect problem, but I do like to use it as a backup, kind of a crossfire of two chemicals always works better than just one. Uh, it is uh, perfectly safe for consumption in gardens, but it is not really a toxin. It's a virus for bugs. The bad bugs eat the plant that has the spinosad on it, and they get sick and die. The good bugs don't eat the plant, and so they don't get the virus, and they're spared. It does no harm to human beings, but its one disadvantage is it's very slow. The bug eats it. He's not going to die for another week, week and a half, and he can eat an awful lot of your garden that, that length of time. So, so that's why it's my second choice. Even though it's eco-friendly and doesn't hurt the friendly bugs, it does have a tendency to be very slow-acting. So it and permethrin working in hand-in-hand or a good combination. Those are my top picks from the thousands of available choices of chemical out there and uh, the ones that are uh, best uh, good bug friendly and bad bug enemy. So that's kind of, there, there are many others. There's malathion, there's safari, which will actually kill scale. There's a whole bunch of uh, chemicals that I used to use that are outlawed now over the years. And uh, there's quite a few others that are less effective. Uh, whenever buying chemicals, I suggest you look at the label and see the percentage, but look for those chemicals. At any rate, uh, that is about the end of the show today. Um, waiting for the credits. Here we go. Bugs, the good and the bad. I didn't mention the ugly, but there's those out there too. I recommend the permethrin for food, the imidacloprid for non-food plants, and the spinosad as a backup for uh, resistant insects. Now, there's one other product I highly recommend you purchase. It's called Wilt Proof. It's a natural sticking agent. It improves the chemical performance of any of these by 40%. So you can use less chemical and get more bang for your buck. And it lengthens its protection up to 50%. It also helps to protect your friendlies, your bees and earthworms, from products like Seven, which are very damaging to them because it sticks it to the plant rather than lets it freely wash off or come off on the bees. So it becomes uh, more of a... Uh, the, the insect must eat it to die from the seven. So that concludes the slideshow for today. 
how much time. Okay, so a couple more items before we cut out of here. I brought a, a chemical or two to show you. Now this is called Triple Action Plus. It advertises to be an insecticide, a miticide, and a fungicide. Well, the rule of thumb in chemicals is if it has multifunctions, it's probably not a good product because what they do is they weaken each of those in order to get all the chemicals into one container and thereby, uh, yeah, they do all of those functions, but they don't do them well. It's like the old boat car. I don't know if any of you ever saw those back in the 60s, but it would drive down the highway like a car and then you could drive into a lake and it would work like a boat. Only problem was it only went 40 miles an hour. And when you got out in the water, if there was a wave bigger than one foot, it would sink. So it didn't work well as a boat. It didn't work well as a car, but it was a combination. That's the way you got to think about these chemicals. You want them to be specifically targeted to whatever it is they're supposed to do. And you want to look at the fine print and see what percentage of that chemical, the active portion of that chemical it is. The higher that percentage, the better that product. And, and that would be things like the permethrin and the imidacloprid or the spinosad. You want to see uh, a high per, highest percentage of those possible. So read several of the competing products and look for that. Now, we did talk about snails and slugs briefly. Uh, they are not insects and are not necessarily affected by insecticides. But there is a product that I do recommend called Slug It. Okay, Slug It will take those suckers out overnight and you will never see them again. I've never seen a spray as effective as Slug It is for getting rid of snails and slugs. However, snails and slugs can appear overnight too. They vanish just as fast if you use this product. So I just wanted to give you those two little uh, uh, garden footnotes before we head out. I uh, hope you're out there weeding too. That's the other problem that we're gonna start experience. Don't forget to water. Water in the mornings or midday, but not in the late day or evening to avoid fungus. And watch for those bugs. First sign of the bugs, mix an ounce of welt proof with your insecticide, one ounce to a gallon. Buy only concentrates, not ready to uh, made products. You want to concentrate is your best bang for the buck. An ounce of the concentrate, an ounce of well proof, and a gallon of water. Put it in a, either a spritzer or a sprayer. You can go out there and coat those plants to protect them. If you don't have insects, you will. Good gardening, people. Okay.